Uh, we got the biopsy results. The doctor called me, and I picked up the phone, and my heart's racing. I knew the call was coming. He says, Mr. Gardner, how are you? And I thought, he sounds happy. <laughs> this is good <laughs> this news. Is good stuff, right? yeah. He goes, you have prostate cancer. This is going to hurt. It's time, it's time for, the for the Suffering Podcast. Suffering Podcast. 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 From the moment we are born, the clock starts ticking. We weave our way through this life trying to avoid the hazards. The looming specter of tragedy is always around the corner. The inevitable day comes when all our fears are realized. As prepared for that moment as you think you were, suddenly you understand that you are in a situation that has no playbook. The phrase, what now, echoes in every corner of your mind. The only chance for survival is to fight off the urge of hopelessness. You are a value to your family, and your true importance now shines brighter than ever, once it is almost gone. Now you must stare down the Grim Reaper, hoping that he blinks before you do. I'm Kevin Donaldson here with Mike Felice, and on this episode of The Suffering Podcast, we welcome James Gardner to discuss the suffering of prostate cancer. James fought a hard battle, but he survived, and he's here to tell. Thank God he survived. He's here. <laughs> yeah, that would be a suffering of a ghost. James, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you, Kevin and Mike. It's really nice to be here. Well, I, you know, I've been following what you do for quite some time now. I love your work and your history, your story podcast, and I think it's wonderful stuff. Thank you very much. We enjoy doing it, my and wife he, Kelly and I. Yeah, I had Mrs. C on too. Mrs. Cunningham. Mrs. From Cunningham. Hopkins. Yeah. Oh my God. Jeez. <laughs> Before we get into any of the fun here, let's give a big shout out to our marquee sponsor. That's Toyota of Hackensack. We don't trust anybody, but we do trust them. So if you're looking for a car, go to toyotahackensack.com and let them find you a car. So James, each week we take a question from our audience. And this week's question comes from <laughs> Cellophane Mark. I love the social media names. Oh boy. <laughs> I'm not even going to get into that. <laughs> What's your new definition of fear? Going through what you went through, I'm assuming that your your view of the word fear has changed somewhat. So what is your new definition of fear? I think dwelling on the fear is something that has uh, is is more my issue. That's what I'm more afraid of instead of he heading hitting it head on, frankly. Prairie fire. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Prairie definitely. fire. Yeah. Mike, what do you think? Yeah, you know what I mean? I think my new fear to stay is just society itself. Yeah. You know, the way this, this, the way things are today, you know, and, and one of my big fears is, you know, as you know, I went to the uh, swearing in last night, mm -hmm. our, our good friend, Bobby Crudell got promoted to detective sergeant. Congratulations, Bob. Good job, Bobby. But they were swearing in new officers. And I, listen, it, it's, to me, it's very emotional, you know, coming from background in law enforcement, seeing these, these, these young kids getting sworn in. I have like such a fear for them now because of the hatred for like law enforcement now. You know, it's just. It's a changing world. It is. The police world. It really is. And it, it's, it's fearful every day of things that are going on now. Now, is that new fear, was it always there, but you just didn't recognize it because you were in the thick of it? Possibly. Yeah. You know, I mean, how many times did you go to a call and it was a crazy call and you didn't think about it until you got back in your car and you said like, wow, holy cow, <laughs> yeah. what, the, what the hell just happened there? You know, so when, when you're involved in it, you, see, a, a lot of fear stems from when you don't have control over something. You know, when we went to a when we went to a call, we had control over over what was happening. You know, my fear now for these new officers is I have no control over them, you know, and. and can't even guide them. No, you can't do anything. You're an old timer now. Yeah, you're a dinosaur. <laughs> yeah. I, I've, I, my anxiety since my shooting has grown exponentially. All right. So, you know, I just had an anniversary and the week of was always bad. Mm -hmm. And now as time moves on, it gets bigger and bigger, but I had to stop and I threw some serious help. I had to stop and start thinking about what I'm thinking. Now, I know that sounds like a like a cliche type of thing, but thinking about what you're thinking, it's it brings down the anxiety for a second. It's like, well, wait a minute, am I am I talking about reality here, or is this just something I'm making up in my head? Nine times out of ten, it's something I'm making up in my head, because I always try to play chess and not checkers. When you play chess, you have to think three, four moves ahead. That's what makes a good chess uh, chess player. But a checkers player can see 
it's move to move. Um, and since my shooting, I've tried to be a good chess player, but it's been to the detriment of my, of my own psyche because it's just raised my anxiety beyond levels that I could possibly imagine. I mean, you know, overthinking causes fear also. That, that's you know? that, that's yeah. it. That's, that's it, the crux of it right yeah. there. Because you, you keep thinking things through and now you're, you're making up 10 different scenarios about one scenario. When is it too much? You know, James, I want you to chime in on this one because when is it too much? You want to be prepared, but you don't want to be irrational. Yeah, I think what it is, is particularly with, with my prostate cancer, which I'll talk about in, you know, in a few minutes, is that I started to dwell on it. I started to over-research it. I started to go on Dr. Google? Yeah, Dr. Exactly. Google, uh, you're, you're going to die.com sort of <laughs> <laughs> thing where you're looking stuff up and it's... Uh, how many how many times did you look up the percentage of survival yeah. rates? Uh, more times than you can imagine. Actually, my wife, Kelly, banned me yeah. from <laughs> any websites about uh, prostate cancer or anything like that. Like no hope dot com. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, so when I said like, not dwelling on it, instead hitting it head on, uh, you can prepare to some degree with knowledge. But at some point, you just have to act and face it and not just as you, be anxious about it. Be well, worried about it. if you look at statistic information with different types of cancers, I mean, um, imagine being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. If you were to go online and look at the statistics of pancreatic cancer, mm. you're going to end up putting a gun in your mouth because they're not good yeah. um, versus focusing on the fight that's in front of you. You know, and I, I think that's the important thing there. Just focus on the fight in front of you. Well, that's what that's what I did. And uh, a lot of the people who I speak with uh, do the same thing or are wrestling with that, frankly, mm. in some cases. But see, that's what we tend to do. You, you know, fight the fight that's in front of you. But we we take on other fights while we're fighting that one fight. You know? We got one hand holding the guy here when we're punching somebody on the side. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. Hey, Mark, thank you so much. Cellophane, Mark. Cellophane, Mark. Thank you so much for sending that one in. Keep sending in your questions, and we will try to get them on the air. So, James, we had this uh, this weird introduction through our very own Andrew Santiago here at a &J Media. Whoa, you like boy. that plug? I'll collect my check after the show. Um <laughs> And he told me all about your show. I listened to some stuff, and I was you, you and your wife Kelly were kind enough to invite me out for coffee at the Caldwell Diner, yes. at the Caldwell Diner, and we found out that we had a lot in common. I know you're part of uh, you're part of a certain church that um, I have some friends that are part part of. The, you're big into the Grover Cleveland Foundation because, as we all know. Grover Cleveland was born in Caldwell. His house is right on Bloomfield Avenue. Right there. Yep. What a crappy location there. Does he still live there? Yeah, he does. He does. He's getting long in the tooth. No, his <laughs> his tumor still lives there. So again, I'm going to whip out some worthless information. Yeah, here we go. Here it is. So Grover Cleveland had a tumor in his mouth and he didn't want anybody to know. So he went out on a boat and he brought a surgeon out on a boat to remove the tumor. Um, he recovered, he was fine, but they kept the tumor in a jar. <laughs> I don't know where that tumor is right now. I think it's in a museum in Philadelphia. I may be wrong with that. Gosh. <laughs> Ship it off to another state. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so they, they ring the Liberty Bell with it now. <laughs> and it's, I saw a picture of it. It's like a decent sized tumor. It's kind How of, do you hide it then? He did. You know, I guess it was, it's no different than today. The politicians only yeah. let you see what they want you to see. Well, that, that's why I said, and-, and Listen, you can attest to this. I honestly believe there's a cure for cancer. No American president ever died of cancer. So you mean to tell me the air is that pure in the White House where once a president goes in, he's just going to be cancer-free the rest of his life? Don't worry, James. We have a tinfoil hat for you as well. <laughs> <laughs> the suffering podcast is cancer free. It's cancer free. <laughs> yes, this is a cancer free zone. Okay, so don't bring cancer in it. Seriously, though, if you think about that, no American president ever they either got assassinated or died of old age. They never came down with cancer. Hey, you want to go conspiracy theories? Did you know in every city that Garth Brooks goes in, Garth Brooks goes into that two or three people go missing? Yes, look at Tom Segura's page. He he constantly hounds Garth Brooks and says, where, where are the bodies? I love conspiracy <laughs> theory. It's awesome. <laughs> so, James, tell us a little bit about we yourself. We got off on a tangent. I know. Oh, that's, <laughs> all right. that's all right. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Where'd you grow up? 
I grew up in New Jersey, northern New Jersey. I was born in Glen Ridge, lived a little while in Belleville, New Jersey. That's down by me. Yeah. And then uh, we moved to West Caldwell, where except for uh, a couple other places, my wife and I lived in Bloomfield for a while. We've I've lived in West Caldwell since I was five years old. So we're talking 60 years. That's that's right in my wheelhouse. They're part of my local. Yeah. Yeah. Really? And I actually, we live in the same house that I grew up in. Really? Yeah. My dad bought it in 1963 for $24,000. Wow. Which was a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. It was about two or three years salary. So yeah. it, was, uh, it was a lot of money. So I grew up in the town. And that's uh, a great town to grow up in. It is. I love West Caldwell. I mean, it's a little over, it's a little over developed now. Um, but it still has the, especially the back roads, it still has that small town feel. Yeah. Well, we have more deer in our backyard now than we ever, ever did before my entire life. I mean, I think that's the overdevelopment too, where they're yeah. pushing them into the, you know, pushing them into the residential areas. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're, they're all over our backyard. I, I hear about people who go out into central or Northeast Pennsylvania to go deer hunting and uh, just come to my backyard. You just got my backyard. <laughs> well, my my friend goes deer hunting every year. Yeah, he goes out west somewhere, and I said, and he'll come home, and he lives right down the street from me. He'll come home, and there'll be a pack of them on oh, his yeah. front yard. Yeah, but the deer, you notice that the deer in Pennsylvania are a little different than the deer here because they'll hide their vitals behind trees. <laughs> here, around here, they'll come up and they almost eat out of your hands. They got no fear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they use our property as a. Uh, Bathroom. A place to use the bathroom. A, a dumping ground. <laughs> a dumping ground, yeah. And they're not easy to pick up, I'll yeah. tell you. <laughs> Those pellets. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah. So, you know, you, you've lived there your whole life. Yes. And how has it changed there? You know, it's really maintained that uh, nice suburban, relatively small town feel. Hometown, hometown feel? Hometown feel. Yeah. Uh, my, my kids have grown up there. My grandson... One of my grandchildren lives there now, and uh, we really we really enjoy it. Well, yeah. you can't tell, but James just had a birthday. He's he's on the William Shatner regiment of youth <laughs> because he looks better than both of Mike and I, and he's it, well, he's not that much older than you. I'm sorry to say, I'm sorry to say, we, we almost went to high school together. <laughs> You might have been a senior when you were a freshman. <laughs> That's a possibility. <laughs> yeah, I was a bicentennial class, 1976. And uh, yeah, That's so... Eight, I, we, eight we years, I Yeah. I was 84. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Big year. Big year. Yeah, so we love it. I uh, I went to school, uh, undergraduate degree in history, which... Makes perfect to, sense now. Yeah. Uh, people used to say, what, what are you going to do with that? Well, Start a are, podcast. Are, yeah. yeah are, are you a teacher or what are you going to do now? Well, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I ended up in business. I went and got my master's in finance. And uh, later on, I got a master's degree in theology when I was in my 50s. That's, that's uh, pretty good. Trying to decide what I'm going to be when I grow up. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah. Still but, not there yet. But that's a perfect example because I, I have my degrees are in English, mm -hmm. English literature. Mm -hmm. And I became a cop. So right. just because you you follow your path in college, it doesn't mean that you, that's where you got to end up. Right. I mean, I was in finance my whole career. Uh, my wife and I started giving lectures in history just to do something that we love to do. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I love it. My wife supports me with it. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the way of most marriages? Yes, yeah. exactly. And uh, we did that for a long time. But then after a while, it, my my job got transferred to Connecticut. It was really a really a rough commute. I was tired. We didn't have time to do that traveling around giving lectures. So a friend of ours said, why don't you guys do a podcast? I didn't know anything about it. And uh, I didn't, we still don't. Yeah. You still don't know anything. about. <laughs> yeah, we, we've got the equipment. We might as well have been looking at the cockpit of a 747. We didn't know what we we're doing. M my wife, Kelly, learned the whole thing. She really, from editing to social media, <laughs> I just do the interviews and I love it. And it was a COVID baby. It really came out of COVID. Sounds like a familiar story, doesn't it? Yeah. It's, so the funny thing is, is their their show, Your History, Your Story, started about the same time. We did. We started in December 2020. Right. And it was just one of those things like, hey, you know what? I got to do something. Let me let me do this. And ours was an extension of, of group therapy. Right. You know, it was a way, it was a catharsis thing that we wanted to get out and, and speak to people and have some decent conversations and have some fun and enjoy ourselves. And right. Then, and then it grows into a business. And then it, exactly. Now, ours started in October 2020. There you go. And uh, we've had 
former mobsters. We've had homicide detectives. We've had uh, presidential de uh, descendants. We've had Hollywood child stars. We had a former munchkin on The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> oh, that's cool. College professors. We've had a lot of fun, and I have learned so much. I've read more books in the last three years than I probably did the last you 10. Know, it really almost like expands your horizons, you know? It does. You, you learn so much about so many different people from so many different walks of life. I mean, it really is amazing. Lives that you tasted that you would never taste unless you were in this yeah. in this situation. But it's a funny thing because you had this this history background, and then you go into business. Was business like a means to an end, or did it, was the love there for it? No, I, I didn't. I shouldn't. I, I had some very good times in my career because I met a lot of nice people, really good people, good professionals, but. Finance and business was not my passion. History, the love of history is just there. It's been in my heart for a long time. And learning more, you know, not just what I learned in school, but learning from people, as Mike was saying, just the different people I've met. Support for the Suffering Podcast is brought to you by Manscaped, who's the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Your products are precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped Performance Package is the ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Inside the package, you'll find the Lawnmower 4.0, Weed Whacker Ear Nose Hair Trimmer, and the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant. And we also got the Crop Reviver Ball Toner. <laughs> this is a, this thing is a life changer. Along with that, boxer briefs. I'm gonna tell you what, these are these are like high quality boxer briefs, and I'm this is no joke. I'm not saying this just because their manscape sent it to us. These are nice. My boys are going to be quite happy in there. You can't tell Kevin's wearing them under the table right now. <laughs> and we also have a nice travel package. Join over 8 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer just for you. 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code TSP at manscaped.com. Jesus Christ, that's a lot of balls. It, it did have a value with yeah. with people skills and um, I think my ability to to study and concentrate and analyze things. Uh, I could analyze numbers like I could analyze people sometimes. Well, that's so. Mike and I have a, a, a leftover ability to read people, to read yeah. your body language, to know when you're getting uncomfortable, when you're anxious, when you're mad, yeah. uh, and it's the little cues that not everybody is going to pick up. It's kind of a a byproduct of what we used to do. Right. So while I do still love literature, I do love it to this day. Yep. I loved being a cop, but and I, and people would say to me, being a cop was like, um, you know, well, you know, you, you feel bad that you wasted your education. It wasn't a waste. It wasn't a waste at all. I did I did something I really enjoyed for you know with my graduate degrees. It's like six years. And you got to play football. I got to play football. And you got to play. Football. And I got to play football. So it wasn't all bad. Did your parents support your love of history? Was that oh, yeah. was there? Yeah, yeah, my parents were both. But my mom was from London, and she she grew up in London during the Blitz. She was in the Royal Air Force. Oh, wow. My dad was uh, in the U.S. Army, and he had been in Germany and Austria and Italy. And at the end of the war, he came back through London, and he was at a tea party, and he met my mother. And so she, real yeah. quick aside on your father being in Italy. Yep. Did your father eat pasta? My father was, uh, his mother was more of a, uh, German type of a cooking okay. person, very solid, like potatoes or cabbage or the reason stuffed I, peppers person. There's a reason I asked that because my grandfather came back from Italy and he, it took him probably 10 years to eat pasta because in Italy they hang the pasta to dry over yeah. the windows. And he says, you could see the swarm of flies yeah. around it and he, it just grossed him out. Yeah. My dad hated garlic. So that was one thing he did not want. To, he could eat a raw onion, but he did not like garlic. Right. But and when he went to Italy, I think he was. He told me he was a hundred feet into the across the border in Italy when VE Day occurred. You don't really so know. he wasn't really there too long to enjoy the food. <laughs> <laughs> now, are your parents still with us? No, no. My my mom died in two thousand six. Uh, sadly, she had Alzheimer's, which mm. was a very difficult disease uh, for naturally for her but for the family it's more damaging it's, to the people around exactly oh yeah because they don't yeah. they really don't know what's going on you know and the family takes the brunt of that that's a tough tough disease yeah and it was tough on on all of us because uh, she was such a delightful person just a big personality and uh she loved history and she used to tell me stories about 
the, the Tower of London and the, uh, the Battle of Hastings and all the kings and queens and stuff like that. But, you know, in the end, she didn't know who I was. So that was kind of a rough end. I, I had a friend of mine whose <clears throat> mother came down with, with um, Alzheimer's, and he said, may God strike me dead. He said, I really just want her to die. Oh. because she became so combative. She didn't know who he was. Yeah. You know, she'd call the cops saying he broke into the house and, you know, yeah, she was hitting him. And oh. to, give, to give a little window into that, have you ever woken up from a nap and had no idea where you were? <laughs> yes. It's, it's disorienting. Yeah. It's confusing. It's like, what's, what's going on? Or you wake up and there's a noise in the house and you, you wake up and you don't quite know what's going on. Yeah. They have that 24 seven. Yeah, it was tough. And she she would smile and be kind to people. That was her old personality, but even even when she didn't remember who you were. Um, but she did live nearby us in a, a continued care facility, so we got to visit her all the time. So going through your cancer journey and witnessing your mother get taken by Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. if you were to make a comparison, mm -hmm. which one which one is more devastating? Oh, I my I'd say Alzheimer's was was far more devastating because I have I have had so far a very happy ending to my story, uh, but my mother did not, yeah. and it was every bit as bad as they said it would be. Um, the journey with it's a, mom. It's a dying a little bit. Every a little single bit day. dying every day. Yeah. Every yeah. day. Yeah. First, she started losing her keys. Uh, then she would say, "Oh, you told me that, and I didn't." Mm. Um, that was tough. It was really. Uh, then we heard, oh, grandma hit the curb today in the car. Or one time my mother came walking up our street with a, a, uh, a, a bowl of baked beans that she made for a party because she bought it, went into a store, came out, and she couldn't find her car. Mm -hmm. And she walked all the way to our house. And that's when we knew it was we yeah. needed to take her for evaluation. So that was tough. She died in 2006, but my dad died back in 88. I was 29 years old, and he died from bladder cancer. Wow, so you've had experience with cancer in the yes. past. You've yes. seen the damages of it. Yeah. And in 88, the cancer treatments have become so far advanced now, yeah. you don't realize it because cancer has always been cancer. Yes. Uh, yeah. What kind of effect did it have on you as a young man watching your father go through this? Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks for asking that. Uh, at the time, my wife and I had two of our three daughters. They were age two and one, just almost one. And my dad loved them. He adored them. Uh, and he couldn't spend enough time with them. But he was diagnosed um, when he was about 68. And he lived about a year and a half after diagnosis. Uh, my father smoked. He was that World War II generation. You know, he smoked. He used to smoke Viceroy's. Oh, Viceroy. I remember no, Viceroy's. Probably no filters. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then he uh, went to mm. Tipperillo's, the plastic tip <laughs> things, yeah. and he smoked those. Thinking he's getting healthier? Yeah. yeah. I'm, yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm still smoking, but I use filters. Yeah. yeah I'm, yep. I'm cutting back a little bit. I'm using a filter. <laughs> yeah. Poor dad. He had an ashtray in his in the living room. There's this black ashtray, and it smelled like, you know, a fireplace yeah. almost. And he would be smoking his cigars and his but you know i grew up around a cloud of smoke yeah i did too so, yeah. a lot yeah. of us did you know 